But right now, we do still have concerns that the majority of fish come from the two countries about which we have the most concerns when it comes to these illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. Tonight, I really want to talk about uh, the 6.2 percent, okay? I want to talk about the really bright spots in the marine aquarium trade. And these are animals that come primarily from the smaller developing island nations of the Indo-Pacific. These are animals that, um, that really show us, or, or this, is a this is an aspect of the trade, that really shows us why comprehensive aquarium trade reform is a good thing and why we should be using our support and purchasing power to uh, provide incentive or to incentivize these smaller developing island nations and the type of fisheries they're running. It's a pleasure to be here. This is what you're missing. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, Finding Dory is uh, coming out today, being debuted in theaters across the country in my hometown of Rockland, Maine. Uh, it is starting at 7 p.m. I'm glad that we are here having this discussion instead, but I do encourage you to see the movie as well. Um, I wanted to start um, by thanking Mark for the very kind introduction and also by thanking the aquarium for inviting me to be part of this conversation. As an aside, as a fisheries writer who reports on a range of fisheries, from uh, seafood to aquarium fisheries, uh, I report frequently on research that is produced by the New England Aquarium. I get a sense that you guys are a little bit of an insider crowd at the aquarium here, so you may be more aware of how much work the New England Aquarium does in fisheries around the world. Their engagement is incredibly important. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to speak here, um, given all that they have contributed uh, and continue to contribute on a regular basis um, from the research angle to fisheries. Um, I wanted to begin with, uh, with Finding Dory because it's timely. Uh, Finding Dory has been in the mainstream media quite a bit recently. And uh, the narrative goes something like this. Finding Nemo came out in 2003. People said, I must have one. They went to the pet store and they bought a clownfish. Clownfish sales increased dramatically and global populations of wild clownfish were harmed in the process. The narrative then continues that Finding Dory is now launching. People are gonna wanna have a Dory or a blue tang in their aquarium and they're gonna rush out to the pet store, buy blue tang and then wild populations of blue tang are going to suffer, okay? That's the narrative. Now, there are a lot of problems with that narrative, and I'll circle back to that towards the end. Andy will get into it in a lot more detail. Um, but it has put the aquarium trade in somewhat of a spotlight in the past couple weeks, and it's not necessarily a good light that the aquarium trade has been put in. So what we need to remember here is we need to remember that a fishery is a fishery is a fishery. Whether it's a food fishery or an ornamental fishery, an aquarium fishery, it can be either sustainable or unsustainable. But what we really need is we need data. Okay? Data is what allows us to be able to determine whether or not a fishery is being fished sustainably or not. So this, uh, this figure here shows the, where the animals, the saltwater aquarium fishes that come into the United States markets, where they originate. And as you can see, the majority come from the Philippines and Indonesia. And that's a problem. The reason it's a problem is because Indonesia and the Philippines both have a fairly poor track record when it comes to illegal, unregulated, and unreported fisheries, or IUU fisheries. Okay? And this isn't just about aquarium fishes. This is also in food fisheries. Now, there's some exciting things happening, particularly in the Philippines right now, and Andy and Michael are very involved with what's going on there. And so that's a story definitely to follow. But right now, we do still have concerns that the majority of fish come from the two countries about which we have the most concerns when it comes to these illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. I'm not going to talk about those fisheries tonight. If you're familiar with my work at all, you know that I cover a lot of those issues extensively on my own blog and for different publications. But tonight, I really want to talk about uh, the 6.2 percent, okay? I want to talk about the really bright spots in the marine aquarium trade. And these are animals that come primarily from the smaller developing island nations of the Indo-Pacific. 
These are animals that, um, that really show us, or, or this, is a this is an aspect of the trade, that really shows us why comprehensive aquarium trade reform is a good thing and why we should be using our support and purchasing power to uh, provide incentive or to incentivize these smaller developing island nations and the type of fisheries they're running. So when most people think about aquarium fisheries, they don't think about this. I've been fortunate, however, in the course of my work to spend a lot of time in developing island nations where this, to me, represents the face of the marine aquarium trade. Okay? I've been fortunate to travel on assignment to places where three kids are motivated enough by a white guy in the water to, to hop into a canoe and paddle out and see what's going on. Okay, these are places where kids, these kids may not have ever seen a white person. These are villages that are just taking their first tentative steps into a globalized economy and into global trade. And the decisions that these villages are making right now about national re natural resource extraction, about the type of industries and the type of global trade in which they're going to be involved, these decisions will have significant impacts on their children and on their children's children. I've also been fortunate to spend a lot of time with aquarium fishers like Willie here. I've spent time with not only Willie, but I've spent time with Willie's family. I've spent time in Willie's community. I've spent time getting to know the village. When an editor sends you halfway around the world to do a story, they usually want you to stay for a while. Okay? And so that's a good thing for me, usually. Not so much for my wife sometimes. Um, what I've learned from time spent in these villages, from time spent uh, diving with these fishers, spending time with their kids, understanding the way their village works, understanding some of the challenges they face, what I've learned is that the marine aquarium trade, a sustainable marine aquarium trade, can be one of the best incentives for socioeconomic and environmental progress. Okay? There are a lot of benefits that come with the sustainable aquarium trade. Now, in my own work, um, I really began to understand this in 2010 when I traveled to Papua New Guinea. And I really learned it um, in spades from one particular village. And in this village, I had the opportunity to interview the chief. And the chief of this village, I was asking him about fisheries, and I was asking him about um, the way that they were becoming increasingly connected with Port Moresby, which is the capital, which is several hours away by boat and then by road. Not an easy trip. This village had not had a lot of uh, outside contact, but they were part of a government pilot program to uh, engage in aquarium fisheries, to engage in harvesting aquarium fishes for the trade. And so I was speaking to the chief about um, fisheries, about resource uh, extraction, about different global industries, and he told me a story. The story was about um, not his own village, but another village nearby. And this other village, they had sold the rights to lumber the ridge behind their village to an international lumber company. By the response I see in some of your faces, I think you know where this is going. And that's exactly the way that I felt as I was talking to him. I kept thinking like, but didn't you know that this was going to end badly? Didn't they know that this would not go well to have this international company come in and log out the, uh, the rainforest behind their village? And the chief's answer, which was difficult to get because uh, Papua New Guinea is a country about the size of California with more than 800 languages. Um, so translating even from village to village is very difficult. But over the course of an evening, um, what I came to understand from the chief was that he said the village didn't have the idea of something going away. Okay? They had lived for so long in such close proximity and association with biodiversity and biomass in the rainforest and biodiversity and biomass on the reef that they had never in generations and generations and generations of living in this village, passing stories down, they had never been able to have an impact through hunting, through fishing, through development. Okay? They just didn't have, an they didn't have a concept that humans could impact the natural world or natural resources in that way. 
Of course, what did happen is this international lumber company came in, they cut down the rainforest, the next rainy season, the uh, topsoil uh, ran off into the bay, the reef silted in, the reef died, the fishes left, and the village had to move. Generations this village had been there, and in a year, less than a year, it was all gone. So the, the Indo-Pacific, these, these developing island nations, these villages in the Indo-Pacific, they face many global issues. They face issues from global climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, etc. We don't need to add to that resource extraction industries or globalized industries that take things away in an unsustainable manner. Okay? And there are a lot of them there. Palm oil plantations, uh, we've got natural gas, we've got timber companies. The list goes on and on and on. But sustainable aquarium, a sustainable aquarium industry or a sustainable aquarium trade is something that actually can provide both environmental and socioeconomic benefit to an area. These villages are moving into a globalized economy. They're moving into a globalized world. That's not going to change. New is meeting old. And it's not necessarily our place to say, don't do this or do this. But if we can support what we believe to be sustainable and what can be positive and good, then I think we give opportunity to the folks in these villages to make good decisions. Now, fishing in general, there's, there's a lot of artisanal fisheries, small fisheries at the village level that are doing great things across the Indo-Pacific. Some are food fisheries, some are aquarium fisheries. What we know about fishermen is that fishermen fish, okay? And we also know, though, and I don't mean much of my work is on food fisheries, and I don't want to say that food fisheries are bad, because there's not. There's a lot of very good food fisheries out there. But food fisheries, look at the value. The price average for a food fish is less than US $1 per kilogram. Look at how that changes when we talk about an aquarium fish. The price average for aquarium fishes is around US $500 per, per kilogram. So we're talking about a very high value fishery. We're also talking about a fishery that is uh, promulgated by fishermen, usually individuals, in boats like this, not in big factory trawlers. And we're talking about fishers that fish like this with small hand nets. So by its very nature, the marine aquarium trade is, is, uh, is, is, is leans towards sustainability. And we should support that. Second example. Told you about Papua New Guinea and what I learned there. A couple of years later, I went to Solomon Islands. Had the opportunity to um, spend um, a couple weeks down in Morau Sound, which is on the Isle of Guadalcanal, better part of a, boat, uh, a better part of a day's boat ride south of Honiara, the capital. And it was here that I met the coral farmers of Morau Sound. And the coral farmers of Morau Sound are ladies. They call themselves ladies. They are ladies. And there are 20 some odd of them at any given time since the 1990s through to today. And they garden, they mariculture, they grow corals in the ocean and they sell them to the trade. So they actually, uh, to, to extend sort of that garden metaphor, they use these racks um, as if they're garden beds. They sew corals onto these little cement discs that are then sewn onto the racks. And then they put the whole thing underwater and tend to it. Make sure it doesn't get too much algae on it. Make sure there are no issues with pests and so forth, that it's in a good area in terms of flow and sunlight. And they let these corals grow until they reach a size that they're marketable for the trade. And then they sell them to the trade. Now, very sustainable from an environmental standpoint, obviously. But it's also incredibly sustainable from a socioeconomic standpoint. When these women get together, and I had the opportunity to sit with them many days while I was there on the beach to tend to their corals, to do their coral farming, it is a social activity. It's a social activity that involves the entire village. You know, well, <laughs> not the men so much. There's a couple of men who are, who are involved, but it involves all the women and the children. And they are there together, you know, joke, it, very embarrassing or very intimidating situation for somebody who doesn't speak the language to be there because they're all laughing and pointing and talking about you the whole time. But they're wonderful people, very friendly. Um, and this is Rose. Rose, at the time when I was there, Rose was the, um, she was in charge of the lady coral farmers. 
And, uh, and I was speaking to Rose about this, again, through a translator later on. And, um, and Rose told me, um, she said <laughs> something that I think is, uh, I think is, bear, is worth repeating. She said, when, you give, when men make the money, when you give men the money, when men get the paycheck, they buy alcohol. When women make the money, the children go to school. Okay? Now, maybe a little bit oversimplified, but in reality, if you look at the history, which I did when I was uh, reporting on this village, if you look at the history from the 90s through to today, there have been countless projects by big international NGOs that have come in and started clam farms and other things in the area where the men got all involved and things got going and there's a lot of money was spent, big beautiful facilities were built, and everyone went gangbusters for three months, four months, until maybe the funding ran out, and then the men said, eh, you know, they went back to do whatever. These women, they've gone through a civil war, and they continue to coral farm, and they continue to be a reliable supplier of uh, mariculture corals to the aquarium trade. It's really quite remarkable, and it's very simple. And here are, um, here are, the, here are the, the coral farmers of, of Morale Sound, the women. Um, and in addition to the socioeconomic benefits, okay, this was, a, this was a village that for the first time was able to buy a radio tower so they could, if they had a medical emergency, they could at least get a message out as opposed to being a day or more away from anything close to medical attention. Um, they, they got schools started. They uh, started to be able to provide uh, things for the home that improved their lives. A lot of social benefits, but the environmental benefits were there as well. These were some of the most beautiful reefs I've ever um, had the opportunity to dive on in my life surrounding this area because they were farming. They were growing the corals. They weren't going and harvesting all the time from the natural reefs. They were harvesting a little bit from the natural reefs and then turning that into a lot of coral for the aquarium trade. Okay, so I started with Finding Dory and I want to circle back to Finding Dory. I told you the narrative that's been floating around in the press regarding Finding Dory. And I'm going to tell you now that that narrative is wrong. And this is probably the most egregious example. Okay? This was a recent article in the Washington Post. And the, uh, the headline reads, Finding Nemo wasn't so entertaining for real clownfish. Now conservationists worry about Finding Dory. The data do not show that Finding Nemo had a negative effect on wild global clownfish populations. In fact, last year, the National Marine Fishery Service, and Andy's going to talk about this in a little more detail, but the National Marine Fishery Service found that the orange clownfish, the percula clownfish, Nemo, which had been um, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act because people were so concerned that it had been over-harvested, that the entire global harvest was less than 1% of the estimated global population, okay? So the data clearly show that no, Finding Nemo did not create this huge disaster for wild clownfish populations. And the only reason we know that, the only reason that the National Marine Fisheries Service was able to make a science-based decision on uh, this ESA petition was because of the data that Andy and Michael um, have worked to bring forward. So it's a very exciting time that we actually are beginning to have some data because traditionally this has been a very data deficient trade. Now, uh, Dory. Dory is a very different uh, critter than Nemo. Um, clownfish, bred in captivity, relatively easy to keep in a relatively small aquarium. Um, you know, makes a pretty good aquarium fish, even for the novice aquarist. Blue tang, very data deficient fishery. We don't know much about um, the fisheries for this species at all, except that there are uh, very strong anecdotal reports of localized overfishing and even extirpation of local populations. And it is a fish that grows too large for most aquaria and is difficult to keep for most aquarists. So not really a great aquarium fish. So yes, I think we do need to be concerned about Dory, and we're beginning to get some data that gives us uh, some rationale, some, some real reasons behind why we should be concerned. Okay, so the plural of anecdote is not data. Just because people say things over and over and over again, just like the narrative that's been told over and over and over again in the press regarding Finding Nemo, 
um, it doesn't make it a fact. Okay? We actually need data to get the facts. And uh, the data is out there. It's just hard to get at it sometimes. All right? And that's what Andy's going to talk about. Andy's going to talk about how he actually was able to get at some of this data and begin to really define and understand the global aquarium trade and really sort of its volume and its biodiversity. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you to talk about the data. Thank you, Rick. Yep. Uh, so um, I love this picture. Uh, we liked it so much we used it for a, um, it's the cover of a journal article we published in uh, Conservation Letters on the, on the coral trade. And um, we, Michael and I spent a lot of time with this question, what's the role of, of the marine aquarium trade in coral reef conservation? And uh, a, lot of, a lot of concern exists with uh, coral reefs, and I'm sure you see in the news quite a bit, um, and there's very good news about, there's very often not a lot of good news about the uh, coral reefs in general. Today an article came, or yesterday an article came out uh, highlighting some of the bright spots in, uh, in coral reefs and, and that some are actually a little healthier than you would expect. Um, most, of the, most of the concern is because of, you know, what Rhett was talking about, global acidification and thermal stresses, but also this global demand for local resources and an local anthropogenic stressors. So uh, whether it's uh, timber or whether it's um, uh, any type of uh, uh, farming or industrial activity in the area could harm coral reefs. For us, the global, the global demand really is the aquarium trade. And much of the concern about the aquarium trade has been destructive fishing practices through the use of cyanide to collect aquarium fish. And then there's always also been concerns about increasing global demand, uh, which Rhett just mentioned um, when it comes to uh, um, movies or, or just general interest. And, and we were really, really troubled by this, by this article because of the, there was so much lack of information in here, but so much speculation about what was going on with Fine and Dory. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the data in just a minute. Um, but a lot, a lot has happened in the aquarium trade in the last oh, 10 years or so, and there's been so much concern at the, of the sustainability of the marine aquarium trade. It's really let, led to a lot of, of large corporations, in particular Petco, uh, to look at moving away from wild harvest altogether and going to a 100% aquaculture product, because that's a lot easier message to make to consumers that because you're buying an aquaculture animal that you're not damaging the wild. And so, um, and this is, if you think about it, if you think about that message of using the aquarium trade as a, as an, a vehicle for providing income and, uh, and um, you know, education and, and environmental uh, sustainability into these small nations, this really uh, moves away from that. Uh, and, and it's really shocking when you, when you start talking to, to consumers, most of the importing countries, hobbyists, activists, lawmakers, right, assume that aquaculture is more sustainable. And most exporting nations, right, they're concerned about livelihood, social justice, social economic issues, but they're also becoming really concerned about environmental uh, issues. Um, and so they're really starting to notice this environmental degradation. And this is where uh, this issue of a lot of wild caught aquarium fish and very few aquaculture fish come into play. So most of our fish that are in the aquarium trade are collected from the wild. So we have about 2,300 species in the trade. Most of those species are wild. Fewer have been captive bred, a couple hundred, and then fewer of those have actually been commercially cultured that are commercially available. So you could either go on the internet today and order a captive bred clownfish or go, on, go to your local pet store and find captive bred fish. But most of the marine fish you would, you would buy are actually wild caught. And I think a lot of consumers are not aware of that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is an unsustainable trade. Part of the problem is, is that consumers have no idea what they're buying. Uh, so if you go to the store and you buy an aquarium fish, you are many steps removed away from where those fish came from if they're wild caught. So there are tens of thousands of people that collect aquarium fish and they usually sell their fish to middlemen who consolidate those to an exporter. And then the exporter pack packages those fish up and then puts them on our airplanes and then they're shipped halfway around the world. They land in, in major international airports. 
Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, Miami, uh, Chicago, right here in the U.S. Um, and then those are are they're they're acclimated uh, here in the in the U.S. They're repackaged up and then they're shipped to to retailers. And then that's usually the consumer's first interaction with them. And so re so the consumer and often the retailer and sometimes the importer and even exporter do not know how these fish are collected or whether the, the collection of these fish is sustainable or, or, or causing um, environmental damage. So there's so much concern over coral reefs uh, and also concern about the trade that uh, there's been a lot of increased regulatory activity. And so we've been involved in trying to provide data to support uh, agencies when they may, are making regulatory decisions and, and there are several different areas where these regulatory decisions can be made. One is in our like importing countries like the United States or Europe. Source countries can also make regulatory decisions. Uh, there's been a few countries in the South Pacific who have basically just outlawed aquarium collection altogether because they were concerned about the sustainability of the trade. So they've just eliminated it because they weren't they were concerned about it. But there's also international treaties and so there's uh, CITES is an international treaty that governs the trade of, of endangered and threatened species, and and you know there's increasing listings of fish that have been listed on CITES. But I want to talk to you about a U.S. law uh, called the Endangered Species Act, and I'm sure you've all heard of the Endangered Species Act. And the Endangered Species Act uh, has been very recently used in the marine environment, uh, particularly to coral reefs, and this is fairly new, and it's made in a lot of uh, relatively new law, and so. What's happening is, is that groups, anybody, any citizen of the United States, any group, any uh, company uh, can petition a species to be listed on the Endangered Species Act and then there are two agencies that have to review the data around that uh, species. And so recent uh, Endangered Species Act petitions have been uh, put forth uh, for corals. There were, there were 82 corals that were petitioned for the Endangered Species Act and then also as as Rhett mentioned, uh, for, uh, for Nemo, right, the clownfish. And so um, a lot of people ask, is, is Nemo endangered? Or, or you'll see headlines in the news that the aquarium trade is endangering Nemo. Um, and so we looked at a lot of this for, for the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. We looked at this for NOAA, and we actually provided them quite a bit of our data. And I'll show you a little bit of that now. Um, clownfish uh, that you know as Nemo are really two species. Uh, they're lumped together as two species. Now, Nemo itself is Amphipion percula, uh, and that's because it's from the Great Barrier Reef, and that's why we know what species that, that it is, is because it's in the movie it's collected from the Great Barrier Reef, and this is the only of these two that show up in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but when we look at the data, and the data is, it's, it's, and I'll show you in a minute how we collect this data, but it can be uh, quite a challenge. We spent several weeks trying to parse this out, but uh, the, the actual percula itself is actually very rarely traded. And you'll notice some interesting things. There are countries that, there are, and there's more countries over here than the other, but there are countries that don't have this species, that they do, it does not exist in, in its natural waters that are actually exporting this species. And so, um, and, and Thailand doesn't even allow the export of marine fish uh, for the aquarium trade. And they show up in our database and they're being imported into the country and we wanted to parse that out of why because that, that why becomes very important. And it turns out that, that exporters mislabel their fish a lot. And so, um, you know, Ocellaris is commonly correctly lab uh, labeled on the invoices, but Percula is often mismatched on the invoices. So a lot of exporters call clownfish, they call it Amphipyron Percula when it's actually not. So it makes it look like the trade of Percula is a lot higher than you would think it was when you look at the database. So we get in here and we look at this and we start looking at why. Well, some of it's aquaculture, and we know that because it's come from countries where these fish do not naturally exist. And so when we go into the invoices and we actually look at the data, you know, these are clearly aquaculture. And then the other is actually mis-ID. So 93% of these that were mis-ID are actually this species. Right? And that becomes very important when agencies are looking at trade and uh, for listings and things like the Endangered Species Act. And then the rest of them are geographic matched uh, from the countries of origin that this species exists, but some of those we know are cultured in those countries. We just don't know how many. And so it's a very, it's a very difficult question to get at is how many fish are being traded 
uh, in a particular species in the aquarium trade, and then how many of those are actually wild versus aquaculture. And so we spent quite a bit of time with this with clownfish, and we've also looked at you know, a variety of species, and I wanted to mention dory as well because it's a very timely time to talk about uh, the blue tang and, and clownfish. The blue tang is very different. It, we know it's not aquaculture, but it does come from a lot of countries. And as Rhett mentioned earlier, we're primarily concerned with this species because it comes from the vast majority of the supply comes from two countries where we know there's destructive fishing practices and we know that there's some sustainability issues. And so we import in the United States on average about, you know, a little less than 50,000 a year from each of these two countries. And this supply changes from year to year, uh, but, uh, you know, and we don't know if this is a lot of fish, to be honest with you. Nobody really knows is, is 150,000 blue tangs imported in the United States every year. Is that a lot of fish? No one has actually an idea of what that is. So um, we do know that this is one of the most valuable fish that's imported in the aquarium trade. This, this fish is actually captured uh, at all of its size ranges. It often is captured and then cage cultured in Indonesia and the Philippines for, for several months until they're larger and then it's exported and great care is taken of this species as it moves through the supply chain. So that gives us some indications of its value. We also know, uh, very troubling, that fishermen have been catching these fish for a long time in Philippines and Indonesia and they have been traveling further and further and further away from their home. And we know that when fishermen travel further and further and further away from their home to continue to catch something, we know that its local populations have been depleted. But again, we don't know what its total population size is. With great confidence, we can say that Nemo is not an endangered species and it has not been endangered by the aquarium trade. But we, we can't tell you with any confidence of what's happening with Dory. All we know is, is that about 125 to 150,000 fish are imported in the United States every year um, from various countries and some of these countries we're very concerned about. Other countries we're not nearly as concerned about. The Solomon Islands has a, has a, a very you know, uh, small fishery when you look at globally and we're not as concerned about that because of the, there's the lack of cyanide fishing that's happening in the Solomon Islands. And then there's some small supply from Kenya and then again 16 other countries. And we're not really concerned about that supply. It's very small. In general, these fishermen are not using destructive fishing techniques. That's not to say that the aquarium fishery can't overfish uh, or threaten a population or species. Now, the reason for that is, is because our current system of import, export, uh, trade monitoring and how that works has, was never designed to actually account for the biodiversity of live marine aquarium fish. So this is what the government knows about what we bring into the country for the aquarium trade. They know we bring marine tropical fish into the country. They know how many marine tropical fish and, and at what value. And that's about it. So um, this would be akin to us labeling all of the food fish that we eat that come into the United States as fish or marine fish, right? Which is kind of absurd. Right? And so, but that's what we know about marine aquarium fish. We know that they are marine aquarium fish. My favorite, though, is other live invertebrates and tropical fish shipments. Right? Right? That's my favorite because that could be literally anything without a backbone. So, and it often is. You'd be amazed at what's listed under that category. So, what we did was, um, and I didn't do any, well, I entered one of these invoices. So, uh, my students. Uh, entered about 28,000 invoices into a database. Um, and you can groan, because there's a couple of them here. Uh, if you listen closely, you can hear Rob's uh, still perpetual groan from this. So, um, and, and this is what an invoice looks like. This is a nice invoice. You can actually read it. Um, but this was a really daunting task. And so to, 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 to deal with that, we uh, developed a software system that can actually do this automatically. And it can correct for spelling mistakes and, and it also checks and lets us know when something, it makes a mistake and quantity. And so this has become a very, very powerful system and we've recently uh, been uh, using this system to, to try to develop uh, some real-time analysis of what's coming into the country or what's leaving the Philippines. We're working with the Philippines government right now to try to help them understand what they're exporting. Because again, Rhett showed you a picture of a stack of invoices. That's actually from the Philippines. So they have all their documents. No one's actually looking at them. And it's the same way in the United States. No one's actually looking to see what's happening. So the data from all of that work is available at, uh, at aquariumtradedata.org. That's a website that Michael and I 
uh, launched, and this is a this is a screenshot of it. And you can go in, and you can actually you don't need to register. You can get guest access, so you can push a button, and you can get uh, you can get guest access. And if you really like it and want to come back more than a few times, you can register for us, so we know who you are. And um, so you can go in here, and you can query all of the fish that come into the country. And so it's a very powerful, rich data source. That's it's got a lot of data. It's the it's the it's the only source of really trade data for the for the marine aquarium trade. A few things about the trade I wanted to leave with, with before we turn it over to Michael. And one is, is that people are always concerned about over collection with the crane trade, but they're also really enamored by the price that some of these fish for, sell for. So some fish sell for $30,000, right? So there are a few fish out there that sell for $30,000 a piece. And people are just amazed, and I am too, that somebody would pay $30,000. No one in the United States, by the way, pays $30,000 for a fish. These fish all go over to Japan. They're very, uh, very into rare fish. But uh, the aquarium trade is extremely supply sensitive, okay? And so um, this is a firefish goby, very popular fish. There's three different color morphs of three different species in the trade. And if you look at their volume, we bring a lot in from the Philippines and they, they sell. You can go buy one for about $15. The other species, which also comes from the Philippines, but a lot less volume, it's in a little deeper water, um, sells for $30, right? A lot less volume. And then the next one that comes from the Marshall Islands sells for over $100, right? Okay. And the reason it sells for over $100 is because it's rare. Now, the reason it's rare is, is because it's found at 120 feet of water or deeper, and so it's kind of hard to collect. We're not sure if it's actually rare. It might not be what you consider to be rare. It's, it was what we call perceived rarity. And some interesting things happened to this fish. This fish used to sell for three or $400 when there was very few coming in. And then all of a sudden, because they were worth so much, the, the supply went up and then the price absolutely plummeted, right? And so they went from a three or $400 fish. Now they're selling for even probably less than $100 now. And this is concerning because anytime you see a jump in supply like this, you have to ask questions like, is this possibly, you know, is, is there overfishing occurring here? Can there be some problems? And so eBay is an interesting place to look for this. And believe it or not, you can go on eBay and you can buy aquarium fish and corals. And there are some corals on here. And you see that this coral is listed for $1,600. And you're like, well, nobody would buy that. Actually, people do buy that. Uh, coral for about that much or, or um, sometimes more and we don't know anything about this coral really this, this well we know some things about it this species this particular coral here uh, comes from a couple places Australia actually exports a lot of this to the United States they have a very well managed coral fishery um, at least that's what the fishery biologists in Australia tell me you know it's interesting that something like this would show up this is a new release we've been trading corals for 30 years and I'm always interested when something new shows up on the market because usually when something new shows up on the market, that means a coral is coming out of a country or some place where it's never come before. And then you have to ask questions like, is it legal for those to come from those places before? And we often find out that these new things are, no, are not legal or they were sort of legal or you know, uh, there's some speculation about what country they actually might have been from. And so there's, that always troubles me when, when I see something new show up that doesn't have any, you don't know what country it's from, it's very kind of mysterious. But that, that's one reason they can get so much money for it. Uh, the Philippines and Indonesia are the, the most important countries. But I ask this question to a lot of people and I don't really consider them, they're the largest countries exporting. But I think the most important countries to the, to the aquarium trade are these South Pacific countries because they supply a lot of income to small islands that have very little choice for income. These people don't have the opportunity to get a job someplace else if, they're, if this trade disappears. They're going to start some other resource extractive process, either fishing for food fish or, or something else. And so um, I'll leave you with this, and that is that data and transparency are critical for the long-term sustainability and survival of the aquarium trade. And that's absolutely essential. Uh, and with that, Michael's going to talk a little bit about aquaculture. All right, thank you. Um, before we go on to aquaculture, I just want to say that um, Andy and I are competing in something called the Wildlife Crime Tech Challenge. Uh, it's a USAID National Geographic and Traffic. Uh, traffic is a wildlife and Smithsonian and Smithsonian. Uh, so, um, and it's it's um, how to use technology to actually find uh, wildlife crime. 
And 400 applications started out. There's a pool of 16 left. We're one of those 16. Um, we have about a month to, uh, to submit our final document. So, um, and that's all about the acquiring trade data because we can actually use that to, to find illegal wildlife because when you're looking at all data, all the legal stuff pops out. Um, but yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, aquaculture because you know we've talked about the importance of wild fisheries, but ultimately we need a balance between aquaculture and fisheries. Everything from the oceans can't come from a fishery. And there are some very good reasons why we should actually aquaculture something. And I just put up three um, here. And one is that we actually can do it. Like we talked about, we can do clownfish. We cannot do the um, Pacific blue tang or dory. So that's kind of one thing on why we would actually do something. Um, if we can benefit a wild population, uh, that's another great reason. One of the problems with the Bangai cardinal fish is that actually was aquacultured early on. There was a lot of industry interest in aquacultured fish, and all of a sudden they were shipping wild fish and calling them aquacultured, and the supply and the demand couldn't really meet up. And um, there's a lot of domesticated strains, especially in freshwater. You know, if you think about all of the, the weird goldfish varieties, you know, none of those are really wild, um, and it kind of keeps some interest going. And this is a, uh, this is a, a marine fish farm in uh, Indonesia. And actually what it is, it's a small part of a food fish farm, and the guy was making a lot of money on food fish and decided, hey, I want to start doing some, some marine fish too. And so again, it tends to be smaller scale, and that's because the inset is actually a freshwater fish farm in Florida. And Andy alluded earlier that we don't really aquaculture many of our marine fish, and we don't. We only do like 5% of the volume of the trade, where in freshwater fish, we're actually doing 95% of the fish in aquaculture. And the whole reason of that is because this is a baby marine fish. There is not much to it. There's no mouth. There's no eye, there's no digestive system. It takes days for these to develop. These are really tiny. Once they actually get a mouth, you have to get food into it and trying to figure out what they eat is really hard because some of these actually eat specific prey that have to move a specific way. So it's not like you can just throw anything at it. So it's, it's really hard to do marine fish. Now, when you work in an institution like this, this is behind the scenes here at the aquarium and the temperate gallery. Uh, this is a deep water antheus, and these fish are just happy as happy can be, and they're reproducing, and they're producing eggs, and it's great. Um, you know, and so we have a lot of fish here breeding, you know, and when you keep large multi-species exhibits that are, the fish are healthy and they're well cared for, that's what they're, the fish are going to do. They're going to breed. So if you go into our giant ocean tank, you actually get... Um, reproduction, these are file fish, and they're just down in the sand tray, and they're starting to breed, and the other fish are coming up and bothering them, and they don't care, they're breeding anyways, and so, you know, this, this is great, and look at the giant ocean tank, you will see more fish reproductive behavior than you ever thought was possible, um, and aquariums all over the country are actually doing this, so the idea is, you need to collect the eggs, and then you need to start growing them up. And so again, that's what we did. And in 2007, we actually did a global first. We took queen trigger fish that spawned in our giant ocean tank. We collected the eggs. We collected food. We got it all together, got it right, and we got some juvenile fish. That success led to a grant in where we actually could train more um, public aquariums on how to collect eggs, how to grow the fish, how to rear them up. So far, we've actually trained um, 25 public aquariums on how to do this. And, um, and we just actually, just last week, we finished training seven more. Um, so it's, it's really good because public aquariums all over the country now can say, hey, we have these fish breeding. We can do that. And so what we can do is, and this is a picture by Maddie Rich. She's an intern. She's sitting right over there. Um, you know. This, this is what we pull out of the giant ocean tank. We actually pulled the egg out, but an egg looks like an egg. This is a little more interesting. But again, you know, um, it's, it's a burfish, and uh, in a minute, the, have to push it. there we go. Oops, sorry for the sounds on. But this is actually our little burfish, about 45 days old. He's fat, he's happy. 
Um, you know, we have this one growing up. We, we actually did four. We have an offsite facility in Quincy. Um, you know, we, we can do this. It's, it's great. The other thing is you start to see these, these really, really, really amazing things. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I love to come to work for because this is a, 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 um, a needlefish egg. So needlefish, they swim around on the top of the giant ocean tank. And if you look at this, you can actually see circulation happening in the egg. How cool is that? You know, that's amazing. You can actually even see individual. And what we'll do is we'll focus down. The top of the egg is getting a little bit out of focus because we're, you know, you have a depth of field and you have to go through the egg. But if you look at the bottom of the egg, you can see little individual uh, red blood cells traveling through uh, the veins. And, you know, this is, this is, these are fish from the giant ocean tank. They're just producing eggs all the time. And, you know, it's our job to go in and get them because if we don't get them, other fish eat them, the filters get them, you know, this, this is lost biological material. And again, you know, we were the first ones to do the, the queen trigger fish. We were the first group to do the southern hula fish. You know, other groups have done these, but, um, and you, you start to learn a whole lot of, of, about this. You know, this egg looks really dirty because of all the hairs on it. Those hairs are actually functional. That actually anchors the egg to a plant so it doesn't float away. So it's actually, the egg is called sticky, and it just, it sticks to stuff. And we actually use that. We put a screen and you get the eggs to stick on a screen. Um, so, um, so yeah, you get to see all kinds of neat stuff. We pull stuff out of the giant ocean tank all the time. We're not sure, we know all the fish in there. We have no idea really what the eggs are. So we're not sure what that is. This is really cool. We have no idea really what it is. And some of it is, you know, we'll see one or two of these, and if we can't grow them up, we never see what they, they turn into. We could look at their DNA and assess them, but that's a destructive method. So we kind of have to balance um, what we do. And, you know, the real, the real goal for what we're trying to do is this, is this is a collection of eggs from a fish called the smallmouth grunt that we have on exhibit. And so what we'd want to do is we want to go from the, uh, the egg to a larval fish. Okay, so this is a new hatched grunt. We want to get that to juvenile fish swimming around in a tank. And ultimately, we want to get them back on exhibit. And I mean, that's what we're really trying to do. When we collect this fish, and Mark alluded to the, su the sustainability of collection for these fish, we collect these fish from the Bahama. 50% of our boxes coming back from the Bahamas are this fish and another species. If we can grow this fish here, because we can, that's 50% less boxes we have to ship back. That's also more time our divers can spend working. Um, we'll go off that because uh, the breathing is a little loud. Uh, you know, that's more time the divers can actually spend teaching kids in the local communities about the importance of their reef. We can, we can do that. We can actually do surveys for the government. We can spend more time actually being, doing functional work and outreach in there instead of just running around and, and collecting. Uh, these are all the species of fish that 18 public aquariums have reared through our program. It's, uh, I believe it's 42 species. It's just shy of 3,000 individuals that we've actually put back on the public ex exhibits. And, you know, we get a lot of clownfish. Again, they're really easy to do. And when we bring an aquarium in and we start teaching them, it's like start with clownfish. You got to do something easy. Uh, the um, the smallmouth grunt, the fish you just saw, we actually hatched those out, grew them up, gave them to the North Carolina aquariums. They put them on exhibit, collected eggs. And so they're actually doing the babies of the fish we've actually produced. So that's actually really cool. And, you know, this is a great photo by Matt Peterson. And really, it's, we're really interested in fish. Again, we're a public aquarium. We want to teach people about fish. But, you know, when, when I go to a science conference, I'll ask people, who, who's had a fish tank when they were little? And, you know, everybody raises their hand because it's the gateway to science. You learn cause and effect. You learn if, what happens if you overfeed or underfeed. You learn what a healthy ecosystem means. You learn hypothesis testing. This is how we, this is one of the, the greatest tools for teaching science. And so this is what we really need to tap into. So 
we're really actually looking at you know aquariums both at home and public aquariums such as ours we're really a force for good and you know um, what we really need to do is just work together work with communities work you know wherever uh, we can and uh, to make it as good as it possibly can be so thank you to Rhett for coming down from Maine thank you to Andy for coming up from Rhode, from Rhode Island thank you Mark for the introduction and uh, I hope you guys had a great uh, low lecture series. Thank, Thank you very much, Michael, Michael and Brett and Andy. So, so we have a little bit of time for questions. If anyone has a question for our speakers, please put your hand up. Yes. I'm curious, the, uh, the pond coral reefs, how long do they take to mature? Good question. The question was, the farm coral reefs, how long do they take to mature? Who would like to uh, respond to that question? Well, the ones in the um, in the Solomon Islands, um, it, it really depends on on how large the person who's going to be um, who's going to be selling them to the trade wants them. So some people do want some larger specimens, but um, the shortest ones I think they were growing when I was there were in the water for about three to six months. Um, some are in the water for much longer. There were some actual uh, coral trays where there are ones that have been growing um, really into sort of mother colonies. They've been there for you know a year or two years. But it can be a couple of months. I mean, some of those, some of the corals that I showed in those pictures, they grow very quickly, especially in those conditions. Yeah. The funny thing about this is, is that uh, this this coral here is actually pretty expensive. And when you're, this is a, I dove on this. This this coral farm is actually in Indonesia, right next to a um, ferry terminal and a cement factory, actually. Uh, and uh, the cool thing is, is that sometimes they grow corals and they kind of go out of fashion, right? And so they, they stop harvesting them, and about a year later, they have a big coral reef of all that one coral's kind of grown back together. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting when you dive on these reefs, you can see what's really popular right now and what is not as much, you know, not as popular, and then see what they forgot about occasionally, too. But it's a. It's, huh? The fish don't care if they're popular. Actually, that's very interesting. The, these areas become really amazing fish habitat. Some of these areas haven't, haven't had live coral in them where this, this coral farm is. Again, it's besides a you know, cement factory and a ferry terminal. And, and the, the bottom here, if you look at the bottom, it's pretty degraded. So where they bring these farms in, they actually become little reefs and they bring fish back in. It's really amazing, the fish populations that show back up. Thank you very much, Andy. Was that right? He has an accent, doesn't he? No. <laughs> you have an accent. <laughs> have I mean, talk about that. <laughs> Oh, for us, like what I'm, what my, I'm not looking at them. Yeah. So uh, you want to know if the, the, the invoices actually have anything on them that people could actually identify what they actually are. Um, so this is a good invoice. So you can read the name uh, and, and you can see the common name and the, and the scientific name, but that's about as much as we get. Occasionally we get some interesting things on these invoices. We get some notes occasionally from the importer that says, uh, you know, did not order this, or this is too small. So we know that they're looking at these invoices, and they use these invoices to stock, to, to prepare for their, the import. So we know the invoices are probably some, mostly correct, but we also know that it's a piece of paper. And so what we want to do is, is we want to use uh, this technology, uh, our Wildlife Crime Technology Challenge proposal is to use this technology, basically, and provide port inspectors, instead of looking at this piece of paper, this is what they do now, they look at this piece of paper, the inspectors, when they look at a shipment, they actually have pieces of paper they're having to go through to determine what's in the shipment. We want to provide them with a kind of an enlivened invoice so they can have the digital version, and if they want to know what something is, they can click on it. It would show them the photo and give them some information about it. And because right now, they're, you, know, the, the, you know, the paper, we've seen some very interesting things on these invoices. Uh, one of the most interesting things we've seen on the invoices was uh, where they had changed the, uh, the exporter or the importer, we don't know who, had changed, you can see the font here had changed, and the name was no longer the scientific name, it was the Filipino name for the hump-headed wrasse, which is a CITES listed species, which is illegal to import, export from the Philippines and would be illegal to import in the United States without the proper paperwork. Uh, it was imported and it was also, that shipment was also inspected. And so it gives you an idea of how challenging it is to catch all of this trade because there's so much volume, right? And so, but we actually saw the computer program actually flagged it and said, I don't, and so the students, I said, I have no idea what this is. And then when, you know, I had, it was brought to me and we were like, ah, that's interesting. We looked at it and we we're like, oh my gosh, that's very interesting that humphead wrasses were coming in 
uh, which is a, you know, a CITES listed species. And you could see, you could literally see the font change on the invoice. So they, somebody made a very definite decision to change the name of that. So collecting eggs from the wild, right? I actually have a, a friend of mine does that in Hawaii uh, because he's curious about different larval forms. Um, and so he's actually collected uh, dozens, uh, he's been collecting eggs for several years from the wild. Um, and there's, two, there's reasons to do that actually. Um, one of the reasons is, is that you get a lot of things that you would not normally have spawning in your fish tanks and so you can learn a lot, right? Um, but the problem is, is that when Frank collects these eggs, he doesn't get this many eggs, right? He gets like two of one species or three of a species or something like that. And so he might raise something. In fact, he has. He's raised some very interesting things before. Uh, but that's, he might never get a chance to do that again. And these fish might, you know, and, and so what he does is, is you know, he might uh, collect broodstock and then go, you know, so he's learning off of this, this wild egg collection. And then he's maybe going to get broodstock of those animals getting pairs of those fish so he can get more egg production. So it's a really challenging thing. The ocean's very big. Fish might spawn uh, a million eggs, but you can imagine how quickly that gets dispersed. And then to go catch those in, in nets, uh, you only get a small handful of actually what was spawned. What actually happens more often is um, there's been a lot of talk about the collection of post larval or, or recently settled fishes. So uh, they've moved beyond the egg stage, but they're still very, very, very small. And some people um, argue that at that life stage, mortality based on predation and other issues is so high that if you collect from that life stage, you're actually having less of an impact on the species overall, rather if you're collecting them once they've settled and once their mortality rates go way, way, way down. So that's something that some people do look at, collecting post larvals and then raising them up in captivity and then selling them. Okay, we have one more question? Yes. Um, I know uh, you guys mentioned that about 95% of the uh, freshwater trade is aquaculture and everything. Has there been a study done similar to this for the 5% that is not involved? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, I don't want anything to do with analyzing. I, I've seen invoices from freshwater fish, and they make our invoices look very simple and easy to recognize. Um, so, but that's a that's a great question, though. Um, so let me show you uh, uh, on this slide. I didn't mention it, but there is a little logo here, and this is a program that the aquarium has been heavily invested in. And this is Project Piaba, and this is from the Amazon, and all of those fish are wild that come from this fishery. And to give you an idea of how many, it's somewhere around 50 million fish a year come from that fishery. Much more than the, aquarium, the marine aquarium trade ever thought about importing. But those fish protect the rainforest. And that's probably the most sustainable aquarium fish in the world. And M Michael can talk a little bit more about it. Um, but but there's, there's other sources of wild fish. But, and we've looked at uh, a supply of fish from India where we actually looked at some invoices and stuff. And, and that was a threatened species. We published on that with some colleagues in India. Yeah, it was actually an endangered species. I mean, they were exporting two to 300,000 of this endangered species every year. And every time the government stood up and said, you can't export this fish, it would disappear from the trade. But then the number of general aquarium fish that India was exporting would go up by two to three hundred thousand. <laughs> so all they do is they just stop naming it and call it something else and then they continue to ship it. And you can buy that at Petco for like 14 bucks. Well, and th that's an interesting fish. So that's the, uh, th the, red, the, the red line torpedo barb. Red, red line torpedo barb, right? And it's recently been cultured in large numbers. So that's a fish that went, went from a wild fish to it's mostly cultured now. In fact, I, I know that Petco's supply is off cultured now probably. Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned their name. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that was a very interesting case where you had, once somebody started looking, at the, you know, they, they moved fish shipments around from different provinces in India and they changed the name on the invoices. We found very interesting things with that trade. But that's, we did one or two, a very small number of species with some colleagues in India with that. But the global freshwater trade is much larger than mar the marine trade, actually. And actually, most of the freshwater fish in the United States are coming from Florida. And so this is, this is one of the real problems of aquaculture is that you have a native fish in a country and they're gaining monetary value from it. And then aquaculture starts and usually that center changes and it goes somewhere else. And the United Nations calls this access and benefit sharing. And that is really never thought of. And in fact, 
uh, Project Piano that works with the Cardinal Tetra in the Amazon, they just had it geographically indicated. So it's an Amazonian Cardinal Tetra, meaning if anybody grows this in culture, they can only sell a Cardinal Tetra. So it's much like Champagne. Champagne comes from the Champagne region of France. An Amazonian Cardinal Tetra only comes from the, the native waters. Doesn't always work, cheddar cheese is, you know. <laughs> 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 uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, just uh, everyone could uh, join me in thanking our speakers again, please. And I'm really happy to actually even talk on this subject here in Boston because you guys actually are also involved in one of the very first hoaxes of mermaids. Going back to the mid-1800s, a Bostonian showman by the name of Moses Kimball acquired what was thought to be a mermaid specimen and he got it from a ship captain in town. He then leased that specimen to a circus guru by the name of P.T. Barnum. So some people have heard of that guy. P.T. Barnum knew that the specimen was a fake, but he also realized that it doesn't matter. People just need to believe. And so what he did was he went about a very elaborate showcase to try and deceive people. And he used the media at the time, which is, of course, print. So he printed up a lot of advertisements and pamphlets like this one up here, all of it showing a beautiful looking mermaid.